Uh, and uh, this is the Pentacam. Um, so show of hands, is anyone concerned uh, about this patient for cataract surgery? Or should we just get our standard biometer done and choose a lens and they don't want a multifocal or anything, they just want to have regular cataract surgery and just be like they were, uh, you know, when they were 18. <laughs> so, um, no concerns, no, no hands going up. Okay, um, I have some concerns uh, here. Um, first of all, let's look at, I'm gonna stand up here, let's, let's look at this number here, which is the gull strand ratio. Uh, normally 82 uh, percent plus or minus a few it's a little on the high side and then if i pay a little bit more closer attention i see that the central cornea is slightly steeper than the peripheral in such a way that i don't like that is this eye dry is there a central nub in the salzman's nodule some irregularity uh you know I, I look at the elevation especially in the back and that looks fine and pachymetry doesn't look really abnormal but I'm gonna dig a little deeper, and, and one of the things I like to look at on everyone is this uh, EKR report. And, and we look at this here, and in disease or in prior surgery, that's quite wide. But this is relatively narrow for the distribution of the EKR powers. Okay, so I'm not convinced that anything's wrong. I'm a little suspicious. Uh, let's look at those Wernicke analysis. And the things I really like to look at to predict problems here is coma here and here for vertical and horizontal coma and then spheric aberration. Any concerns there? Or is this a normal eye? My big concern is that the spheric aberration for this cornea is essentially zero and the 3D shot of this wavefront aberration profile is inverted. This patient had hyperopic LASIK and they can't remember ever having laser. And if you don't apply the proper correction factors through the barrett truke formula, then you could miss that, okay? Now, of more concern is the patient's fellow eye. They actually had a note in their chart from a different doctor saying they had ectasia. So suddenly post hyperopic LASIK ectasia, perhaps a show of hands, who thinks this is LASIK-induced ectasia? Well, luckily no one, okay? It's not ectasia because what do we need for ectasia? First, we need focal inferior steepening, or it doesn't have to be inferior, but it most commonly is. Um, but uh, uh, that, that, that exists, yes, okay. Uh, we need some central corneal thinning. Uh, no, and we don't have any apex displacement either. Um, there's no hotspot back here. This is not ectasia. That's just simple, slightly decentered hyperopic LASIK. Uh, so the hyperopic LASIK here is quite obvious. And again, the, the gall strand ratio is not too bad. It's a slightly off, but something's red here. Higher order aberrations are in the red zone. You should look at that. Ah, look at the EKR though. Look at now the distribution of the EKR powers. Quite wide, not a normal cornea. It should be a tall, narrow peak. Um, and the EKR readings on this map show that central steepening a bit better, slightly decentered. So if you have asymmetric power top to bottom or right to left, this is a big indicator of coma. And coma patients are always unhappy with the quality of their vision because everything is smeared. And there's gonna be some spheric labration in this cornea as well. So here's our Zernike tree. Again, this is inverted, it doesn't look right. Minus 243. Now this is really easy to mess up because 243 would be a normal number, right? But the sign makes a difference. Positive 243 is normal. Minus 243 is almost a half a micron off. That's a lot of spherical aberration problems. So if you see plus 0.5 on your spherical aberration, you're gonna know there's a problem. But if you see minus 243 and don't really pay attention to that minus, you've missed the same error, okay? By even more. Look at this vertical coma, 835. My cutoff for coma of any kind for a multifocal is 0.3 microns. This is 0.8. This is significant. A multifocal lens would be poor choice in this candidate. What about a toric lens? Can we use a toric lens in this case? 
The rules for toric lenses are that the astigmatism is regular, repeatable, and orthogonal. Let's back up for a second. Well, this is not regular. It's weighted more on this side than the other. It is repeatable. Other uh, topographers showed the same thing. Is it orthogonal? Well, is the flat axis 90 degrees to the steep? Yeah, it's kind of close, but the irregularity is what gets me. So one half of the toric has to correct all this. The other half is overcorrecting that. You're just going to flip your coma. They're not going to be happy paying you extra money to have poor quality vision. So what's important here is we're not going to look at a multifocal or even a toric in this eye probably. And what lens should we use? The common J&J ZC Boo or the Alcon SN60WF have a little bit of negative spheric collaboration built in to counter the normal positive spheric collaboration of the cornea. They already have minus 2 point, or 0.243, and if we add another 0.2 or 0.27, we're really gonna get a lot of spheric collaboration that's gonna be very bad for this patient. They're not gonna like you at all. So this is one where you're gonna use a, a neutral or even a positive spheric collaboration lens. Now, the uh, MX60E has neutral, and the SA60AT actually has a little positive spheric collaboration in the lens, which could counteract this negative, and that's where you would use this. So hyperopic LASIK can slip through under the cracks because it regresses, and it's easy to miss it. When you see a big difference in the two eyes, and you see these unusual spheric collaboration numbers, even though the gull strain ratio wasn't that deranged, got to open your eyes and say, what's going on with this patient? Why are they going to be unhappy after surgery? And let's solve that problem now, or at least educate them on what's going on so that their expectations are in line with what we can actually achieve. Uh, questions in that case? Bill, any comments? The, the only problem is obviously the asymmetry in the amount of hyperopic lace was helpful and tipped this off. And yes. The right eyes, I certainly could sneak right under the radar. Subtle on that right eye, the asymmetry was the key. Yeah. Okay, so here's a patient comes in. They had myopic LASIK in 1995, which is an early generation eczema laser. So they did remember they had it. Okay. Um, well, that, that axial curvature doesn't look that flat centrally. I, I don't see a blue lake. And, and the gall strain ratio is 83.5%. It's dead normal. Uh, are you sure you had LASIK? I know I had LASIK. For sure I did. Oh, well, that is a little wider and the EKR is a little flatter here. So, yeah, okay, maybe you did. I would have missed it if you hadn't told me, maybe. Ah, look at the sphere of collaboration. 526. Okay, so increasing positive sphere of collaboration. This means that the cone or the, the dome of the cornea was flattened below that, that ideal sphere, right? And so that's what happens. And so, yeah, this is LASIK and it's myopic LASIK and you have to do something about it. Not too bad in the coma but don't do anything that increases this spheric collaboration. The SN60AT lens with positive spheric collaboration is vastly cheaper in price than any other lens in the market. And I have seen places that dictate this is their standard lens to be used because it's so much cheaper. And these patients come to me with a perfectly done surgery, bitterly mad, because everything looks so much worse than before they had surgery because they've induced even more spheric collaboration, which makes everything look blurry and glow and soft edges. So a negative spheric collaboration lens, like the ZC Boo or the SN60 would work great right here. Here's the fellow eye. Again, normal gull strand ratio, uh, nothing terribly jumping out at us, but you can see the broad distribution of EKR values, which indicates something's not right with this cornea. And the spheric collaboration is just slightly increased. And it turns out they had a lot more LASIK in one eye than the other. But what I want to point out is this curvature here. You see how it looks irregular? Like there's more curvature dropping up here than there. The reason that the spheric collaboration and the gall strand ratio are not that far off of normal is because this person had a mixed astigmatism ablation. So they didn't really have a big power change they had myopia in one eye and mixed astigmatism in the other. So that makes it a little difficult to decide which formula to apply, because you have to choose if it's RK, which obviously this is not, hyperopic LASIK or myopic LASIK. And you have to decide, do they look more myopic or hyperopic in their correction? And in this case, because the spheric collaboration is pushed more toward the plus side, it was probably slightly more myopic, mixed astigmatism than hyperopic. It turns out that the math is not going to be significantly different in this eye 
with the lens choice, but you might as well be as accurate as you can. All right, another cataract consult. Uh, they've had myopic LASIK, okay? Uh, now things are starting to make sense because our gulf strain ratio is 80%. That's a little lower than normal. It doesn't look particularly flat here or thin, but it doesn't look ectatic. Oh yeah, the base of our EKR distribution is a little wider than I'd expect, not terrible. And 438, again, not bad. Does this remind you of anything? Maybe the exact last topography I showed you, the topography I showed you, this is another mix of stigmatism. You can see where they've corrected the stigmatism differently in the two axes. They are probably slightly amyopic with mix of stigmatism. Now, what's helpful about this case is if they can't remember they've had lacing or what they had, now we're starting to figure it out with uh, the tomographer that a placido disc just won't give you. Now here's the other eye, and we're at 81%, so slightly low, but now you can tell, well, this looks a little flatter here. The tangential curvature kind of accentuates it. But what is going on there? Is this RK? Well, no, we'd see that on the lab exam, that'd be very obvious. No, there are some subtle Salzman's nodules all the way around the LASIK flap, which can happen. You can get some scarring around the LASIK flap from dry eye, eye rubbing, things like that. Uh, and actually, I needed to do a superficial keratectomy on this eye, which is really the most nerve-wracking corneal surgery I do that should be easy that's not, because I'm peeling Salzman's nodules off the LASIK flap where it stops and where it was cut, right at that edge there. And I don't want to lift the flap and get epithelial ingrowth. Um, and so this is showing us those Salzman's nodules there and telling us things are a little irregular or you're going to smooth this cornea out if you can get these Salzman's nodules off first. And you can notice that this is a much broader distribution on these EKRs because of those Salzman's nodules. And it's not a nice dome like we normally see, even in refractive surgery. Sphere collaboration is quite high. This looks like a myopic ablation in that three-dimensional thing. Um, What's interesting here is how different the coma is and 0.499, it's getting up there a little bit. Again, hard to put any stock in these numbers because the Salzman's nodules are probably messing with it. So don't go straight to cataract surgery in this case. All right, now here's a gentleman comes in for cataract. He's had prior RK. But when you look at this scan, how could you tell that this is prior RK versus very early generation myopic LASIK? where you had a central ablation only. I'm gonna pick on you, Bill, because you've got the degree behind your name. How do you know, without looking at the patient, this is RK and not myopic laser? Uh, the back elevation is also significant. It would change the myopic laser. Yeah, a big back elevation here, right? And the other thing that relates to that is this, 100% gall strand ratio. Myopic LASIK tends to push it up a little bit. RK tends to push it above 92% by Doug Koch's work at, at Baylor, okay? So when you see above 92, 94% your gall strand ratio, it's probably an RKI, okay? Now, a lot of times you're gonna see, it looks like little flower petals of blue coming around right along the cuts and things like that. But this guy didn't have that. He's had severe flattening. And here you can see something very interesting that also points at RK, that it is a wide distribution of EKR. But you notice that this particular graph is really shoved this side. We get really flat corneas with RK. It's hard to make a LASIK cornea down to the high 20s. You can do it, but high 20s, that's hard. But RK will hit the 20s all the time in terms of the keratometry there. Here's another question. The flat meridian of this cornea, pretty well orthogonal to the steep. Should we use a toric lens in this eye? I wouldn't. Okay, here's why. They have 1.3 microns of spherical aberration. That's a ton. And they might not be happy with anything other than a hard contact lens to erase that. And a toric lens burns your hard contact lens bridges. Burns it, it's gone. Because all you do is uncover the touristy of the lens if you put a hard contact lens in their eye. So I probably wouldn't ask him to pay a bunch of money so that he gets rid of the stigmatism but still sees his glowing orb around all the lights and a soft fuzzy this to everything. I'm going to do a, a, a nice lens on these people. I want them to have a nice outcome. I'm not just treating individual numbers without thinking about the entire case. Uh, and a fair amount of coma here as well. I, I really want you to pay attention to this, though, because this, if you 
Think back to the other ones I've showed you, Myopic LASIK. Does this not look fundamentally different? And it helps you understand what RK does to a cornea. When you cut the cornea in a radial fashion, you are causing, you're inducing ectasia in the peripheral cornea. And that ectasia stretches out and then flattens the central cornea. Fundamentally different than simply flattening the central cornea without affecting the periphery. And this picture of the aberrations of the cornea shows how we're bulging this way and that way and flattening centrally. That's what RK does. That's why it's a little bit unpredictable. Here's the other eye in this patient. Again, a very deep blue lake and the keys are really flat, hard to get that flat with LASIK, really high gall strand ratio. The elevation is quite high here. This is what your typical RK, EKR distribution looks like. Rod, low uh, distribution, anywhere from 25 up to 38 diopters. I show patients this screen and I say to them, any one of the powers of your cornea here is what I could choose for the calculations for your lens. Which one should I choose? If it's only one spike that goes straight up, it's pretty obvious which one to choose. Every unit of measurement that we're off here will be off on your refraction, anywhere from 25 to 38. So let me know which one I should choose so it's on you. Right? And then they start to get the idea. Oh, there's some variability here. You can't predict which lens to put in my eye because the powers across the cornea that you're measuring are so variable, there's no guarantee of being spectacle-free. And this is a disappointment because they've already paid good money in the past to be spectacle-free, and then that made it so that they probably won't be spectacle-free in the future. Okay, So I only say that it's not really true what I'm saying because we are a little bit better than a 10 or 15 diopter span of what lens is going to be in there. I'm just letting them know. There's a variety of powers here that might work, and there's no way to know for sure which one it's going to be. And that EKR distribution is what's useful. All right, how do we feel about two microns of spherical aberration? <laughs> okay, remember how it's getting a little bit upset because they're point two off? Okay, this is a hundred times worse. All right, this is terrible. Um, and then look at our coma 1.2 and 0.996. Classic case of why you would never put any premium lens in here because they are going to need a hard contact lens to solve these higher order aberrations and the toric lens would burn that bridge. If you put a toric lens in, they just get to buy a buy toric RGP, which are hard to fit and really expensive and only a few people do them. All right, uh, any questions or comments in this section here? That's just showing a couple of cases. They're all prior refractive surgery, some easy to see, some not so easy to see, some we had to figure out, but all of them important to show patients what's going on and figure out what the correct power of lens is, but also the correct model of lens depending on sphere collaboration and other factors. The other thing I really like using uh, is the EKR65, which I've mentioned before. And Jack Holliday can give you an entire dissertation on this. I'm not here to tell you exactly how it works. What I'm here to tell you is that it's really good in keratoconus. And this is what I use now in any patient with keratoconus to determine their IOL power. What happens if you just run the standard biometer on a keratoconus patient? You're gonna end up hyperopic. So you kind of a fudge factor. Well, I'll just aim for minus two. Is that enough? Is that too much? It's kind of a fudge factor. That's why they call it a fudge factor. Well, you don't have to just guess. You can actually use the EK65 and get pretty close. So here's a patient that comes in. Uh, obviously, they have keratoconus. Uh, and actually, I felt they needed to be cross -linked. So one of the nice things that I think people don't realize is that you can track progress on the Pentacam. And so we showed flattening and stability after cross with our progression map. So I did that first. Uh, and then we started to get some uh, measurements here. And um, this is really important here. It's first of all, very broad, but also it has two big peaks. These keratoconus patients will come in and they say, I can read just fine without glasses and I can see far without glasses. They have multifocal corneas. And that's what that's showing you, a multifocal cornea, okay? Now this is just my standard biometer, my lens star, and it's saying you should use a 24 and a half diopter lens. And I aim for minus two because isn't that our fudge factor? Okay, there's a better way to do this though. So I, did, I ran every test in the book. The Atlas SIM Ks, which should never be used to calculate a lens power, but they were averaging 44.6. The Cassini said it's 45.7. The Pentacam Ks, which again, I wouldn't use alone to calculate an IOL power, or 43, 
Lenstar is 44. The EKR 65, four millimeter pupil aperture average was 42.9. So who should I believe here? If I use my standard Lenstar, uh, I'll be 1.1 diopters hyperopic on what I want. Depending on what I choose to use, I could be a half diopter to 2.6 diopters off. I chose the EKR 65 and you can see my calculations here. So my average anterior coronal power, I put in the EKR 65 value right there. And uh, I wanted to get a predicted result of around two. I could come up with 2.11. And she ended up a spherical equivalent of minus 2.3. So I missed by just under 0.2 diopters. That's a lot better than a two diopter fudge factor in Syria land. Okay, she ended up just where she wanted to end up. And all the other ways to measure the average coronal power would have been more hyperopic than this. And you can imagine the disaster if they want to be Plano and they end up plus two or plus three. So the EKR in this case and many others that I can show like it was the most accurate average keratometry value. And the auto keratometry on biometers is going to miss by a doctor to two in many cases. So I don't find any other means that is better than the EKR 65 of measuring keratometry and keratocones. So that's just several examples of uh, things we can do to use the Panicam to our advantage in figuring out exactly what's going on in these unusual cases or in cases where the patient declines to admit they had surgery through forgetting or <laughs> denial or their significant other is not there to remind him, yes, you did pay for laser back in the 90s. This was 30 years ago. Huh? Um, so that's why I do this on everyone before surgery and make sure I understand what's going on with these corneas because nobody likes surprises, especially bad surprises. So this is helping me avoid refractive errors and especially spherical aberration surprises where even if I have the exact correct lens, things just still don't look right. If they know beforehand, it was a pre-existing condition. If they find out afterward, it's your fault. Thank you very much. Very good. <laughs>